All right. Well, hello, everyone. I'm Lorelai Tanji, the University Librarian at UC Irvine. And I'm so pleased to welcome those of you here in the room in Langston Library and also joining via Zoom. So for those of you on Zoom, we are offering a live transcription of this event, which you can turn on at the bottom of your screen by selecting closed captioning or view the full transcript. Before we get into our main program, I would like to start with an acknowledgement of our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Ahashiman and Tongva peoples. Now we have so many distinguished guests in person and on Zoom, too many to mention them all, but I do want to acknowledge two special people in the room. First, we are very honored to have in the audience someone whose family, family's ranch and whose mother, Joan Irvine Smith, played an essential role in the genesis of UCI and who plays a lead role in the big plan book that we will be hearing about. So join me in acknowledging UCI trustee, James Irvine Swindon. And we are also pleased to have in the audience one of our staunch library supporters whose husband, Dr. Forrest J. Grunigan, was a leading voice and supporter of the creation of UCI's School of Medicine and a central person in the merger of MDs and ODs. For his many contributions, UCI's medical library is named after him. So please join me in acknowledging Mrs. Dolores S. Grunigan. Okay, so uh, today we are honored to hear from three experts on the history of the city of Irvine and our beloved UC Irvine campus. C. Michael Stockstill, H. Pike Oliver, and Robert Dannenbrink. Mike and Pike's book, Transforming the Irvine Ranch, Joan Irvine, William Pereira, Ray Watson, and The Big Plan tells the story of how the agricultural Irvine Ranch transformed into a world-renowned planned community with a top 10 public university. And so Robert will then share insights on the overall plans for UC Irvine and its surrounding uh, community based on his time working for the Irvine Company and as a UCI campus planner. Now, it's my pleasure to present our speakers. Uh, Mike Stockstill and Pike Oliver are the authors of the new book, Transforming the Irvine Ranch. And Mike Stockstill joined the Irvine Company in 1978 during his 13-year career there. He helped formulate and implement strategy for major planning and policy issues. His co-author, Pike Oliver, who is joining us remotely from Arizona, has worked on real estate development strategies and master planned communities since the early 1970s, including nearly eight years at the Irvine Company. Robert Dannenbrink is a nationally recognized urban designer and planner with 50 years of experience in architecture, urban planning, and city and campus planning, and he has worked with the Irvine Company and UCI. Following Mike Pike and Robert's presentations, we have reserved time for questions from the audience, and our audience Q&A will be moderated by Dr. Crystal Tribbett, UCI Libraries Research Librarian for Orange County and Curator for Orange County Regional History. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Mike and Pike. Thanks very much. It's great to see a lot of familiar faces. Uh, thank you on behalf of Pike and myself for your interest in our book. Let me just start with a real quick personal story. I gave a copy of my book to Jim Swindon, and I said, Jim, if somebody wrote a book about my mother, I imagine I'd find something in it I didn't like. But I hope you'll agree we were respectful and we were factual. And he was nice enough to smile and say, I'm just glad she's getting some recognition. So, Jim, thank you very much. It's, it's really an honor to have you here today. 
thanks to the UCI libraries for giving us the opportunity to present and discuss our book, Transforming the Irvine Ranch, Joan Irvine, William Pereira, Ray Watson, and The Big Plan. It was published by Rutledge last June, and the book tells the story of the transformation of the Irvine Ranch from an agricultural empire to the largest and arguably most successful new town and master plan community in the United States. We had a tremendous base to build upon, thanks to the architect and the planner, Ray Watson. Ray joined the Irvine Company in 1960. He was a junior planner. 17 years later, he was the president of the Irvine Company. And he wrote six chapters of a memoir. And he gave two very long and extended oral histories. And much of that material was available here at the UCI Library and Special Collections, where I spent a lot of hours, enjoyable hours, fascinating hours, delving into the past. And we really enjoyed it. And that became the framework for our book. This map, which uh, is going to be moved by Cheryl, Cheryl is moving. There she is. She's going to move and give us a map. Thank you. This shows the location of the Irvine Ranch within the broader context of uh, Southern California. And the red star right there, uh, that highlights the location of the UCI campus. So you can see the Irvine Ranch about one-sixth of uh, Orange County. Uh, before California became part of the United States in 1850, Spain and later Mexico granted huge parcels of land to soldiers and other loyal subjects. Beginning in 1864, a partnership that included um, uh, James Irvine and uh, two other people um, began acquiring these um, large parcels of land, the ranchos. And in 1876, James Irvine I bought out his partners and took sole possession of what became the Irvine Ranch. Now this is a uh, 1899 surveyor's map and Bob Dannenbrink's hand-drawn illustration next to it. And it shows the scope of what was then 110,000 acre holding, stretched from the Pacific Ocean down by Newport Bay all the way to the Santa Ana River. That's about 22 miles. By the late 1950s, a series of smaller land transactions and two large World War II military base condemnations had reduced the land holding to about 93,000 acres. Still a huge, huge empire. You know, Orange County was kind of a, a sleepy place until World War II. There were just over 130,000 people living here in 1940. Newport Beach wasn't a lot more than a fishing village and weekend cottages, and civilization in terms of homes and businesses stopped completely at the western edge of the Irvine Ranch. Here's how we describe that change that began in 1950s. The Irvine Foundation and Irvine Company recognized that a tide of humanity would soon crash upon the western boundaries of the ranch. Real estate developers and their agents were already making offers. Other forces of change were gathering, including those of the powerful University of California. The future demanded expertise in engineering, finance, management, urban planning, and real estate. As the title of our book indicates, the three individuals who were most prominent in the creation of UCI in the new city in Irvine were Ray Watson, William Pereira, and Joan Irvine Smith. But let me start with Mrs. Smith. Joan Irvine Smith was the granddaughter of James Irvine II. He was the man who, from 1905 to 1947, built the Irvine Ranch into an agricultural empire. She was the only child of his son, James Jr., who died tragically at 42, when Joan was just a baby. As Joan grew up, she was often in the company of her grandfather, who at his death willed 20% of Irvine Company stock to her. But J.I., as he liked to be called, gave the majority ownership of the Irvine Company to a charitable foundation that he had created 10 years before his death. In 1957, 
Joan joined the board of directors of the Irvine Company. She was just 25, and she began a 20-year battle over control of the Irvine Company. She was beautiful, willful, wealthy, determined to take control of what she considered to be her birthright. Now we turn to William Pereira. <clears throat> Interesting factoid, he won an Academy Award when he worked at Paramount Pictures as an art director. Pereira, a larger-than-life figure, a man Ray Watson described as one of the best salesmen he had ever seen, said Pereira could walk into a room and just take charge of it. In 1958, the University of California was considering sites for a new campus in southeast Los Angeles County or in Orange County. Pereira thought the Irvine Ranch made a lot of sense, and he played a pivotal role in convincing the Irvine Company the Irvine family, and the Irvine Foundation to make the extraordinarily generous offer to sell 1,000 acres, 1,000 acres of land for $1. Thereafter, Pereira received the commission from the university to prepare a master plan for what became UCI and from the Irvine Company to do the same for a community of 10,000 people uh, 10,000 acres immediately adjacent to the new university. The original Irvine was going to be from UCI to where the San Diego Freeway is now. Finally, Ray Watson, who Pike and I both worked with and uh, just admired and loved. He was a, a great human being. Um, Ray spent 17 years at the Irvine Company. He came as a junior planner and he finished as president. Uh, he was an architect by education. But early in his career, he really developed a keen and lifelong fascination with the interplay between architecture and planning and how that leads to the creation of a whole humanistic community. Ray grew up poor in Oakland. He lived in a boarding house run by his grandmother. He lived among people who were, as he described in his oral history, hard of luck. This gave him an appreciation for the underdog as well as a personal commitment to democracy. And that outlook manifested itself in many of the decisions he made during the planning of Irvine Company uh, communities. <clears throat> for Watson and a handful of planners and engineers hired by the company in the 1950s and the 1960s, it was a once in a lifetime opportunity. They were gonna shape a new community from literally from nothing. Ray and his fellow planners envisioned the new community of Irvine as a place where people at every stage of their life could reside in the same neighborhood or the village and have a meaningful, full, and rewarding life together. They were, of course, influenced by the big plan the Pereira plan, uh, firm had prepared, but now they had to figure out how to make it happen, bring it to life. And while wells and natural runoff and agricultural reserves were, uh, reservoirs were sufficient to irrigate a great deal of Irvine Company farmland, that output would not come close to supplying the new university and the city. So statewide water resources had to be accessed. <clears throat> it was the company's engineer, William Mason, who devised a solution uh, that was squarely centered in water law, written for agriculture. The Irvine Company created a California water district, which is controlled by landowners. Some years later, after a legal challenge, control of the Irvine Ranch Water District shifted to a publicly elected board, but in the beginning, the landowners controlled it. And Bill Mason took what was a radical approach in the 1960s. He created a wastewater reclamation plant and implemented a recycled water rec distribution system used initially for irrigation, but later expanded to commercial applications. Here in Irvine, it's the purple pipes that you see everywhere. By 2020, just <clears throat> nearly a quarter of the IRWD's total water supply came from recycled water. This map highlights the current extent of the IRWD's reclaimed water distribution lines. They're everywhere. When it came to crafting site plans for the first residential villages, the company's planners were influenced by the Pereira plan, 
but also by several academic and professional planners who emphasized concept like edges to communities uh, to give them identity, generous use of setbacks to soften a streetscape, and combining densities and architectural styles in a single village to encourage diversity in age, income levels, and family status. In his oral history, Watson mentioned two planners whose, whose views had strong influence on them. The first was Kevin Lynch. He's the author of The Image of the City. And Lynch proposed five key elements of design that are evident in Irvine uh, uh, developments today. Those five are paths, edges, nodes, districts, and landmarks. Bob can tell you what that all means. He's the planner here. The other key influence was <clears throat> Dean Sujak's The Hundred Mile City, which reflected his view that the auto had expanded the traditional definitions of urban of an urban city. They all combined into what Ray referred to as creating a sense of place, which in turn led to the concept of fortifying a new community identity as a village, something the planners described as larger than a neighborhood but smaller than a city. Master plan neighborhoods with internal green belts uh, were unusual in Southern California when the company first decided to uh, use them in the first Irvine Ranch master plan villages in the 1960s. The first two areas where the planning concepts became reality were East Bluff on 550 acres next to the upper Newport Bay in Newport Beach and University Park and Rancho San Joaquin neighborhood adjacent to it. That was on 933 acres along the southern edge of the future right away for the San Diego freeway. The home buyers and the renters liked the green belts. Thus, the village became the foundational planning element of the Irvine Company. So the idea, as we said before, was to create a city of villages, each having its own identity, that, and natural landforms would be reflected in the siding of the, of the uh, village. Turtle Rock looks a lot different than Woodbridge, for example. And each one would have a master homeowner association to take care of ongoing maintenance and agricultural or architectural control. James Irvine II, best known as J.I., he ruled the ranch like a modern day monarch, but his life was really filled with tragedy. His first wife died just after just 17 years of marriage. His oldest son died at the age of 42. He was the victim of tuberculosis. Irvine's daughter, Catherine, she died shortly after childbirth, and his youngest son, Myford, committed suicide. J.I.'s decision in 1937 to create a charitable foundation that would hold the majority of Irvine Company stock on his death set the stage for what became an epic conflict for control of the ranch. On one side, Joan Irvine Smith. The other side, a man who'd been J.I.'s trusted tax accountant, Loyal McLaren. The conflict came to a head when Congress was considering the Tax Reform Act of 1969. A proposed element in that law was a restriction that charitable foundations couldn't own more than 20% of a business. Joan Irvine Smith lobbied hard for that. She wanted that restriction in the bill. McLaren and the foundation lawyers, they put up a brave battle on Capitol Hill, but they were no match for Joan Irvine. The other actors in this 93,000 acre stage were academics led by Clark Kerr. He was the president of the University of California at that time. And the man he had selected to be the first chancellor of UCI, Dan Aldrich. How many people in here knew Dan Aldrich? My favorite memory, I was telling one of these people, was Dan used to arm wrestle a student at the beginning of the year in the quad. I can see him in my mind right now. And he always won. He was strong. <laughs> um, the University of California decision to locate on the uh, Irvine Ranch didn't happen easily. This was not a slam dunk. This is, as, as you write history, as I've been fortunate to do, you find out a lot of things that became urban legends really weren't the case. This was a fight. This was a tough fight. The, the president of the Irvine Company at the time, when first approached about giving land 
said, and this has been quoted four or five times, he said, I wouldn't give a damn nickel to the richest university in California. So that's how they started. They were kind of far apart. It was a real fight. It was a real fight. So the University of California didn't happen easily. And one sticking point that doesn't come up a lot, but became pretty clear when we did the research related to discrimination. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. It's hard to imagine what Irvine might have become without UCI as its physical and intellectual impetus and anchor. So what began in 1965, as we all know in this room, has turned into one of the nation's most prestigious academic institutions in a very short period of time. Now, let me mention a couple of events that transpired in the history of the ranch that had they gone a different way, um, we would be having a very different presentation. Let me start in 1886. The first James Irvine has died. He's left the ranch to his son, but only when his son turns 25. And in the years after Irvine's death and before J.I. was 25, the Irvine family decided to put the entire ranch up for auction. And there was an auction, but there was confusion at the final bid and the sheriff uh, conducting the auction called it off. He said, we, uh, I don't know who won. We're going to do this again. It was never done again. James Irvine II took control of the Irvine Ranch. Amazing, amazing story. Fast forward. It's 1959. The Irvine Foundation controls the Irvine Ranch, and a developer from New York comes to them and proposes, says, let's form a partnership, and we'll develop the ranch splitting the ownership and the income. And the foundation, they were led by Loyal McLaren, was mindful of J.I.'s almost biblical desire to keep the ranch in single ownership for as long as he could. But McLaren thought the idea was interesting, and he was going forward when Joan Irvine Smith and her mother sued and stopped him. McLaren backed off. The company then made the seminal decision, we're going to hold the ranch and we're going to plan it in one piece. Now back to UCI. Um, Clark Kerr believed that the Irvine Company had a policy of discriminating against blacks and Jews. You read his oral history, or his book, he's really matter of fact about it. Well, we knew they did this. Ray Watson was apoplectic when he heard that. Um, it was not the case. So Kerr's opinion was also backed up by Norton Simon. Norton Simon uh, was Jewish. He tried to buy a house in Emerald Bay. Emerald Bay, once owned by the Irvine Company, but sold many years previous, had covenants on the land, which was not unusual at that time. No blacks, no Jews. And so Simon, understandably, was distressed. And so between the two of them, they had brought this up in conversations with the company. Um, and they didn't realize the Irvine Company had sold Emerald Bay decades before. But when they found out about it, they still were concerned, and it became a sticking point during the negotiations. In the end, it was the company, led by Joan Irvine Smith, who saw the value of having a university and what that would mean to the value of the land. And they gave, for $1, 990 acres of property, and then a few years later, the company sold the university another 510 acres at half price for university-related purposes, bringing the total UC Irvine land holdings to 1,500 acres. The 1969 change in federal law advocated by Joan Irvine forced the James Irvine Foundation to sell its shares in 1977. In the final days of that bidding war, there was an individual who joined a group of people that had come together to bid for the Irvine Company. They're mentioned in our final slide over there on the right. That man's name, Donald Brent, uh, who would obviously become the owner of the Irvine Company in total later. We have a whole chapter of our book um, devoted to the creation of the winning consortium and the incredible events that took place during the bidding. And I think you'll enjoy reading it as much as uh, Pike and I did in writing it. Appreciate your attention. Uh, if you'd like to buy a book, I'll be selling them over at the table at the end.
Clear. Clear. Can you do it? Yeah, can you do it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Get my handy dandy my pointer handy out dandy here. Chris, I'm going pointer out here, Chris. I'm going to be pointing to the PowerPoint. Uh, first, uh, uh, I have a lot of material to try to do in the 15 minute introduction. So some of it's going to kind of go by fast, but I, I have no other way to try to cover it. Uh, first, I spent 15 years with the Irvine Company and then followed the, well, actually with six years here at the campus. And there's a whole story behind that, which I'm not going to even get into. It wasn't intended that I be at both uh, follow up at the, at the but interestingly, so I work on the whole Irvine Ranch, all 90,000 acres, all around the university, and I end up coming in and doing things for the university. Okay, we can go to the first slide. Oh, again, scale, scale. Oh, there's the Irvine Ranch outline. Manhattan Island obviously floats easily. 145 square miles is the ranch. City of LA, one of the largest incorporations in the country, city, is 460. So that's, that's about a third of the city of Los Angeles. Scale is, you know, it's trying to develop identity and identifiable places, sense of place. We can move. It's very difficult, even at smaller scales, and give, give it a loan at scales like this. Next. This is the last time the Irvine Company's own general plan or master plan was actually displayed. This is about 1975, of the entire ranch. Uh, it was already uh, up superseded because by this time, all the overlapping jurisdictions had their own general plans. Irvine, the city of Irvine being the last in terms of the central area, as you heard from, from Michael already, Prairie was engaged by the company to plan the area south of the 405. Then later, when the company acquired its own planners, they did a plan for the whole central part, essentially with the city of Irvine, and it was actually approved by Orange County. But then, of course, it became, after the city adopted its own general plan, it became superseded. Uh, we can move on. The company, uh, in terms of what, what, the, what geographic unit would be the best, most appropriate way to try to define, give some sense of identity and sense of place, it, it talked about, it looked at the neighborhood scale, no, that was rejected. There would just be too many neighborhoods in a city of, of, the, of this size. Looked at sectors. These are sectors which were pretty much farmed by the freeways, the 405 and the 405. Made the central district, the northern district up to where the foothills began the geogra uh, topographically, the southern district south of the, of the 405, and then the, the, the coastal hill, hills. Uh, but it's, it's, settled on, uh, it's settled on the uh, next slide. On the village scale, and in Pereira's planning for the company, he strongly recommended that the company do develop, does develop the ranch as a series of, of, of villages. This is a, my view in, done in about 1977. This is a bird's eye, bird's eye. So parallel lines are, 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 van, are vanishing, converging. Uh, the, the black line part of the sketch was done by 70, 77. I, I added these, these red outlines as villages that were de de developed since uh, 77. So again, they're right now there's about 35 named place names, villages on, on the Irvine Ranch. All with a subtle, some great, great differences in terms of their, their imagery and their, their sense of place, have special features, uh, special uses. There was, there was commonality in terms of the village concept, to be mixed, mixed housing types, uh, all local services. Uh, we, we can move on to the next slide. We're going to have to move fairly rapidly. Here's a very, very diagrammatic, also bird's eye fashion, so the parallel lines are, are vanishing. Most outsiders would think that planners determined everything that happened on the Irvine Ranch, but that's not true. You heard Michael refer to the, the two marine air bases were established in World War II. It basically precluded, while they were in operation, any residential uses. So therefore, those parts of the city, the west and the east, were relegated to non-resident industrial business parks. Well, the, the company did want to establish those kind of uses as a tax base, but that's why they're there. So the whole central part of the ranch, said with this, this lattice, would be the residential villages and eventually a, a major focal point in the south end. Now, even the roadway systems, the major arterials, the, the company developed a hierarchical mm -hmm. system from the throughways down to community collectors, local collectors, down to the lo local streets. These were mostly agricultural roads, which basically formed the outlines of where future villages would be. So even that aspect of, of, the, uh, of the formation, the, the, the organizational units, uh, was, was really not 
it was it was kind of ex existential kind of factors uh, created those. Let's let's move to the next slide, which is a this is a more refined version of that that was done in about seventy five, and this was kind of my advocate again in, in the bird's eye uh, format with the vanishing line. We're looking we're over the coat. Here's the Newport villages that had had been developed by then. Uh, this was my advocacy in terms of an urban design structure with the lattice of residential villages, the, the non-residential industrial and business areas on the other sides. Uh, the, op the drainage channels formed a very convenient kind of a buffer edge between the residential and the, and the re industrial. On the east side, I likewise, I showed a major open space corridor along Sand Canyon, which is what that arterial is there. The difference in the city's plan, the city's general plan resembled the countries very, very much. There was a difference in terms of the total population yield, the cities being much smaller than the Irvine overall plan at one time, I think, projected about 450,000 people. The city's general plan is much le less. But getting back, the city chose to put the open space spine on Jeffrey, and they also, this was a village where we had already a plan. This was called Quail. This was called Quail Hill. We had a village plan, but the city decided they wanted to preserve it as open space. So, in that sense, their open space spine eventually it will come all the way down and link up with with Quail Hill. Whereas I had the open space. It seemed like a logical thing to use to, to separate the residential from the non-residential. <laughs> and then again, major major focal points: the UCI campus, uh, the uh, uh, Concordia Lutheran College, the Irvine Valley. Uh, community college. Uh, major nodal points in terms of commercial services, you see though those red red blobs are, are commercial sites along the major arterials. We can, let's move on. We're going to have to move rapidly. I'm sorry. One of the most significant things that uh, happened uh, in the sort of about, let's see, between 75 and 77, the company and the city jointly agreed to fund and administer with a third party consultant what was called an urban design implementation plan. And the company, we already had all of our, we had an urban design element of the company's general plan, but we wanted the city to buy into it so that every time the company came in with a new village increment, we didn't have to go through explaining why we have entry points, edges, definition, things like that. So we jointly did that. And it's a huge com competing, competing uh, plans, policies, principles. One of the most salient things is all I can talk about in our time limit, it was called streetscape. That, that's simply using street trees to do something besides just, just the enhancement of, 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 of trees and, and the climatic benefits. Uh, landscape architects use the term creating signatures. That is using the actual palette, the types of trees, to help give a, a, a character to a, to a street. And make, trying to summarize this shortly, basically what was, what was developed was that the north-south arterials would have low dome type landscape in the medians and tall vertical, double rows of tall verticals on the sides. And then the opposite was for the east-west streets, because there were some existing, if you, as most of you know, there were a lot of eucalyptus windrows planted to, to break the Santa Ana winds. Because the eucalyptus were in, incorporated in those medians, it became reversed. The tall trees were in the median and in the lower. Uh, next, next slide, here's a sketch of an example. of what This is one of the north-south. Uh, it happened to be Jeffrey, but anyway, the low dome, dome type treats in the medium, medium and tall verticals. I think one of the most admired features of visitors that I have coming here is, is the, the, the great streetscapes that now have, have accrued in, in the city of Irvine with the, this the differentiated uh, sense of play. It helps, it helps not only, it's not only a, a, a beautification aspect, but it helps to help co a cognitive image of people living in a place when you, can, you know a street by a, by a streetscape. And you know whether you're on a north-south or a, maybe too subtle versus a north uh, east-west street. Let, let's go to the next next graphic. Okay, uh, I've been asked to also make some commentary on this project across the street, the University Town Center. Uh, this is flashback 1962. Pereira, when he did the campus plan, he felt very strongly about the need for this kind of the ability to plan for the adjacency to to a major, to a major campus. This is per Pereira's plan. Very formal, this is Gateway where we're at. He extended the formal axis of, of Gateway sector. I like to call them academic vi villages. Anyway, extended that axis right through the midpoint of the, of the town center, 
over the top, over the cliff and into Mason Regional Park. It's probably a bandstand or something. It's kind of a culminating. And then the, the, the transverse axis was also a series of straight, as you can see, straight wall, wall segment. This was very intensive. There's lots of graphics. That there's no time to, to, to show. This was very intensive. These are like six to eight story structures, for pretty, primarily in the central core, as well as on the edge. There's parks on e each end. So it was a very intensive and quite quite formal and mixed use. There was re there was residential. That's the key point I forgot to mention. There was residential incorporated on the upper levels over both office and retail. So it was a very very urban place. Now, let's go to the next next slide. I worked on this Dermacy Town Center area about I think eight eight years. This was uh, my original visioning type diagram. Here here's the central core. Here's the U UCI gateway where we're at. Uh, the core area with the town square as as the as the basic focal point, and more informal meandering the the pathway we referred to as the promenade that linked up all all the all the individual neighborhoods. Uh, we also had an elementary school, which the, the school, school district did not did not acquire. Uh, the other the one thing about the the original prayer plan, the company did not want to see that kind of formality carried into into the university town center. They felt the town center should have its own kind of spatial character and, and geometry. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, this was my depiction of, except for the central area of what that kind of character, this was to be an urban place, no single family, it was all attached housing, both sale and, and rental. Here's major par park, local parks in each of the three na neighborhood districts. The, the school district went by the wayside. So this was the central district. The city, the city and the company jointly developed goals for what this place should be, a really a vibrant urban, urban in contrast to all the other suburban villages in, in Irvine. We worked on this area for scheme after scheme, about eight years. Next, the best scheme of all, which actually got approval, was this scheme here. Again, I try to do this. This is a, a massing kind of air, air we're looking for a, a, a air, air view, kind of a massing. These are not, this, not, these are not detailed design. These are strictly massing. This was the axis coming, a mall coming across now, of course, a pedestrian bridge from the university. Uh, kind of a triangulated uh, town square, a mid-rise office tower. We showed a mid-rise condo. These were a mix of office and retail. These were the apartment areas integrated. Some of the parking, we actually did a parking, a shared parking uh, uh, study with a consultant to, to reduce the total amount of parking to the minimum amount. And this area here was, was de decked with, with one level below, one level above, same thing over here. This was a hotel, this was office. But so it was a very integrated. Here come the, the promenade. You walk right through from, from the resident apartments into, into the, uh, the, the. Now this wasn't this wasn't vertical mixed use, which at one time was contemplated. And the city was very fond. They were hoping that the, that kind of, a, of an urban urban kind of scale would, would be achieved here. That was not. But this was very very interconnected. This one here, this location here, there was like a valley that the city was fond of. So that, that was preserved in this particular scheme. This is the hotel, as I mentioned. So the hotel had an amenity adjacent to it. Let's go to the next one. This is just a two-dimensional version of that. You can see, again, the continuity, the vehicular, only one place you'd have to cross, or the main promenade, you didn't cross it at all. The other place, the other vehicular access came off the top, and there was just one place where you went across to get, uh, continue on all the corners. You could go to each, each of the adjacent blocks. So this was a fully integrated and urban. While it didn't have the red, we had a mid-rise condo at this location. There was residents living right at the plaza. Next, that was not achieved. The, the commercial division never were keen on mixed uses. And this is what is, as you know, anybody who's gone across <laughs> there, this is like, but, but you know, it's a typical suburban, so suburban, you know, like introverted, group of retail and, and office, and then this is the apartment separated, and the, the promenade is a very tenuous link through, through, through sur surface parking. So it's just not the kind of integrated place. Sort of disappointing projects on the ranch for me as an urban designer, and many other people were disappointed. In fact, uh, we know that Mr. Mr. Watson was not very pleased with what, what, what turned out in, in this location. Let, let's, we gotta move on, I'm sorry, we got, to, Okay, now, now we're going to look at the, uh, the university. 
This is the original Carrera scheme, and you all know it's, it's getting in the, the, the ring wall with the radiating spokes. Now, many people think that this was Pereira's concept to put all the major disciplines on, on a circle. It was actually Clark Kerr, the president of the university, we know now, was advocating that Pereira do this. So that the, the theory was that each, each, each uh, discipline would have kind of equal standing on the campus because there's no place on the circle that has any, any greater dominance than any other place. So the, these, uh, again, uh, this ring wall was 1800, Pereira put the physical dimensions to, to this concept of having the, the, the diverse uh, uh, schools that run around the ring. It's an 1800 foot diameter, takes 20 minutes to walk full circle, but the minimum class change is 10, 10 minutes to, to get half, halfway around. Uh, with, a, with a 16 acre, basically a void, an amenity, a, a open space park, but but the, the focal point of the radius is, is basically a void in the center. Let, let, let's and the radios uh, went out and, and terminated at points in, in the, on the outer outer campus. That there, well, like obviously BioSci went on out into the medical school, and as as, as it turned out, you know, in the original plan, fine arts was not this location. It was part of the extension of the humanities. That became uh, severed when the Pelton Loop was in. Let's go to the next next slide again. I got it. Okay, here's the specter of the campus when it opened. Uh, it's like it's three. Here's these junctures between the radials and the ring were referred to as the quad. That's where the term quad came from, or quadrangle. But most quadrangles in most most examples are defined on all four sides. That's not what these were. But these are this is three football field lengths from, from each quad to the next. And from this is humanities, here, here's the library. This is the first phase of the library got, got expanded. Uh, this is humanities, there's there's biosci, and I think one building in, in physical sci was in the first uh, first increment. Uh, but Pereira felt that in their reports, they felt that a sense of monumentality. Let, let's, let's go on to the next slide. There's several slides that are just making the same point. We, we go next. He, he thought that a monumentality was necessary on this flat, barren, ro rolling site. So he, has, he sets the buildings on these platforms to further kind of to separate them from the terrain. The other problem with, here's, Here's students using the inner ring. Actually, the inner ring is a shorter diameter, but you have to you have to trans, uh, transfer vertically. You have to go down and then go back up, either through stairs or, or ramps, to get from the, the ring mall level into this in, inner ring. Let's look at the next. There's several. Uh, we can go next. There's several photographs. So these are all Ansel and Adams, original black and white photos he did. The other thing, that prayer to the, set this kind of tone for the central core. Uh, core he thought that a, a, a continuous five-foot module of these pre, the precast panels was, was important to give all the, all the discipline area, all the schools, kind of an equal status on, on, on the ring. And as you see, again, they're set on these plat platforms, further kind of getting the sense of monumentality. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the next slide. We have to move, move, I have to move along pretty quickly here with this. And these decks, again, the de except for maybe fire door, fire exits, the only place you enter these buildings, actually most of these early buildings, they're, they're entered at the midpoint halfway down on the radio mall. So they really don't, they don't even animate the, the ring wall, which was one of the downsides. Let's go to the, to the next. Uh, there's a lot, there are a lot of professional critics of this original prayer scheme because of the sc scale of it. And these kind of formal concepts, whether it's schools or, or other, other cities are, are very difficult to phase over time, particularly when there's such an uneven uh, funding uh, schedules in most of these kind of operations. So it takes very long for something to materialize. Now, just because the sheer mass of more buildings coming on, the visual separations are beginning. This, is, this was done, this was a, a depiction of the built farm in 1990 when we were doing the up, when I was here, we were doing the update of the long range. But this is just the central core. There's the Peltus and Loop. We were getting encouraging when designers were working on spots along the ring mall where, that were not yet built to encourage them to orient the entries of buildings to, to the, these quads, the, the crossing points. For example, that happened in physical sciences, it happened in biosciences, uh, it happened in engineering, although some of the original Frank Gehry, 
iconic buildings actually got taken down, but there's new buildings there now that do help. And then this didn't, it wasn't, didn't occur at this point in time, but social sciences, we'll see it on some future graphics coming up here. And then these two locations in the humanities, they had not been built yet, but those two locations were very critical to help bring that kind of activity uh, to, to, the, uh, to the ring mall and to the, the, those, those quad locations. Next, please. Okay, out of the 90, 1990 plan, this is again just central campus. The dark, the, the shaded areas are, were existing buildings. The, t the dark tones are pedestrians, pedestrian malls and, and, and pathways. What we could kind of read out, what we're trying to encourage was a more unique kind of spatial character in each of the academic, I would call them academic villages rather than quads. And you can start seeing where you see the dark tone. Here's that whole ensemble that came into social sciences with that plaza area right off of the, the ring mall. Uh, those two areas did get filled in. Was, that's not a prediction of what the building shapes are, but the entries do, do relate to, to the crossing point. Uh, the, new in, in, the new lab building that came into bioscience, and of course the bioscience library, that was also a major uh, uh, bringing activity up toward the, toward the ring mall. New buildings in physical side did the same thing as sort of relating. And then as you can see, the, the, the shape of the malls, we encouraged, uh, we have a whole set of design guidelines that went along with this. It's just, it's just too much to talk about at one time. But we were encouraging building footprints that would enclose spaces rather than this idea of freestanding buildings for every increment that, that came along on the campus. You can see how malls would have various different shapes. And in each case, there was a termination at, at the Peldeson Loop where uh, or either trams or autos could drop off people. So that was the termination of it. They did not extend on, except, except for, med, for BioSci and the medical school extent. And of course, fine arts, because again, fine arts at one time was not interrupted from the rest of the communities. But when the Pel Peldeson Loop was real, realigned to line up with Bridge Road going into the town center, and over here, Berkeley uh, was the other end of the Peldeson Loop. But we got to move on. Sorry, I got to keep try to keep to the 15 minute time time frame. You could next. Okay, this is the this is the three dimensional version of that. The gray were the existing buildings. All the red tones, uh, academic uh, studies did space projections for us. And at this point in time, the campus was relegated 27,000 students by, by, the, by the regions. But Ch Chancellor Peltison told us to look at least to 30,000. So the space projections were based upon a 30,000 student campus, and it's already, already been, been, been passed. Anyway, so the red areas were all the new infill that would come along. And these were just generalizations. These were not design, detailed design building. It just represented the amount of, of additional square footage that was, that was gross square footage that was to be predicted in that particular time frame. Again, trying to bring a much more kind of uh, individualized academic village, different spatial characters, animating the, the ring mall, particularly at the junction points. There's just so many, I mean, let's, let's, we gotta move on, I'm sorry. Sorry to be rushing this, but there's so much. Okay, now I can either talk about, I've been asked to also talk about the possible expansion of Langston Library, and this is what was in the 90, I can either do that in, in the dialogue portion, or I can do it right now in about two minutes. I think we have one minute. Okay, one minute. <laughs> All right, this is a blow up. This is just the gateway quad sector. And again, the, the red tones were the future projections. Here's existing Langston. And at the time, I showed expansion as literally contiguous wrapping, wrapping around the existing building, which would have meant you got to take off all the precasts. Construction, the vibration, uh, the, the noise, I don't think that that's feasible at all. Next slide. And I just did, did just some very crude diagrams. I think any expansion of Langston, totally transparent connector, glass, glass walls, glass, glass roof, and, in, uh, and enough spacing so that landscape could, could grow between the, the, the existing and the future. This is just one, uh, you know, keeping ortho, ortho, orthogonal geometries, right angle geometry, saw toothing because you got a social science tower sitting here. Next, another option, and maybe a smaller footprint, maybe even a smaller than this, and maybe it's more of a tower. So the, the library has a, a more of a vertical emphasis on the campus. Only building now is because the engineering tower. And then one last. Again, free farm, you know, softer corners. Anyway, this is just, these are just total. But I think, that, I think very strongly it should be totally new separated with a, a very clear separation 
uh, for any, any, and yeah, I don't exactly know what, in the long range plan, a undergraduate library was, was uh, t supposed to be cited here. I don't know what happens to Langston. Does it become graduate and, and, and doctoral research only? I, I, and I don't know what the program would be for this expansion. Is it more, more of the same stacks and reading? Anyway, that's, that was my, that's my response to uh, Wendy Morner and, and uh, Audrey Young uh, were the, the people who asked me about uh, the, the expansion. Thank you. Thank you. Q&A here. We have seven minutes. We have, okay, so a few times. So I turn it over to you, Crystal. I will say nothing other than thank you for using primary sources. Sure. And um, really encouraging um, our audience to come and visit Special Collections and Archives to do some digging of their own. It's amazing what you think you know about the past, but you can always discover something new. So we're going to move on to questions, of which there are many hands. I'm going to take that first gentleman right there. If you can stand up, say your name, and then your question, please. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Raymond Lim. I represent RARI Veteran Housing and keeps IDB veteran students from leading their cars. Um, my question is, I see a lot of the organization and the planning and the coordination with multiple different interested parties. For someone that would like to repeat the same success in the future, what, were, what would advice you give to that organization? Pike could probably answer that well. Sure. Yeah. Where's our visitor from the desert? Did he hear it? I didn't. I didn't hear the question. That oh, early, sorry. that was a very long question. And the question, more or less, was about how um, would you repeat how could success? somebody repeat the same um, big plan um, in the future? Yeah. Is, is it still applicable? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. And um, there's <clears throat> we. we tried to be brief today. One of the things that we talk about in the book is the evolution of environmental planning and regulation during the time following the creation of the original plan that the Pereira firm put together. And uh, anybody who's been involved in any kind of development plan in the years since, I think it would be uh, find it very challenging to to put together a plan like this in today's environment and execute it. Uh, it was just a really completely different environment. The other thing, we talk about the success factors and why this worked. And someone asked a question about how the land was assembled. You know, the original uh, ranchos were gifts to the uh, important people by the Spanish and later Mexican government, but uh, James Irvine and his partners, James Irvine the first and his partners acquired the property, but the total acquisition price was something on the order of $1.20 an acre, which if you inflate to today would be about $23 an acre. So there was a lot of land assembled for very little money, and that was a big factor in allowing a big plan like this to occur. Thank you. Um, gentlemen in the back, please. Uh, just a comment. I, I think this room was where Ray Watson gave his last public appearance, I think early 2012, when he gave his papers to uh, the library. Uh, so question, uh, Michael, what, what other sites were seriously considered before the state landed at UC Irvine? There were sites in Yorba Linda and there were sites, I think, in Fullerton adjacent to what's now Cal State University, Fullerton. And Newport Beach. And Newport yeah, Beach. There were 21 sites considered. That's right. Uh, the uh, Where Pacific View Cemetery. Cemetery now is was considered to be a site. That's a story that's in our book. And East Bluff, I believe, also was a, one of the sites. I didn't know about that one. Right on the, on the, on the cliff side. Can I, um, gentlemen in the plaid, please? Yeah, um, my name is John Pocchi. Um Why did they have a private university here, like USC or something? Why did it become, a, why was it California? Why did they decide to become a public university? The um, master plan for the state of California envisioned the, the public university system, both at the UC level and the state college level. So it was being driven by that master plan, which was approved by the state legislature. So essentially it was a decision made by the government 
that uh, there would be universities at, from one end of the state to the other. Uh, Gloria Mikiashi, I work here at UCI, but I was also a student uh, some years ago. I heard that the original plan was to have the city, uh, city, the center of the city across from the campus, that the city hall was going to be there and all that, and then basically with the student unrest in the 60s, that plan changed. Is that true? That's correct. Ray Watson says in yep. his oral history that he had advocated to have city hall and Irvine Company headquarters yeah. built at University Town Center to give it mass. The decision had been made, according to Ray, and then the uh, Bank of America building was burned. And uh, the next week, the Irvine Company said, we're going to locate it, Newport Center, not here. <laughs> <laughs> but wasn't, Michael, uh, I also heard that uh, the reason they didn't keep it there was that the people in other parts of Irvine said all the good things were happening in the south of Irvine, so they had to have a political balance and have the eventual city hall site in central Irvine. The, rather than north, north or south. The city did make the decision to put City Hall where it is yeah. now. I don't recall the specifics, but in terms of Irvine Company headquarters, Ray was very clear. It was the burning of the Bank of America building that oh, yeah. spooked the company and made him decide to move to Newport Center. No, I was real to, re referring only to the city, city, where they put their eventual City Hall. Yeah, that was a city decision. Yeah, yeah right Bob's here. right about that. Oh, it sorry. was this concern about distributing. I'm Kevin Bossemeyer, KUCI Radio. Oh, when do, why two military bases? Why not one? And also, when does the spectrum, residential, retail, when does that start to come into fruition? Pike, you want to do that? Um, the, the question, Pike, was sure. why, well, why two military bases? Oh, got it. I got, oh, you got it. Yeah, I got the question. Yeah, so um, that's, I'm not exactly sure. They There was a, uh, there were two types of, of aviation use uh, related to World War II. Tustin was the, the lighter than air base, the dirigibles uh, for patrolling against uh, submarines along the Pacific coast. And then El Toro was a jet fighter base uh, and for training, which of course that actually carried on up until uh, the late eighties. Um, and that's one of the interesting things. Uh, we didn't have time to go through this today, but uh, we talk a little bit about some of the things that didn't happen in the big plan. And one thing or the, that the big plan didn't anticipate was the closure of the military bases. And uh, as you can see from what uh, Bob Dannenbrink highlighted, that had a big influence on where the commercial industrial areas were located. And if, if their closure had been anticipated, it, it might have been designed differently. And there was another question there. Or? Spectrum shopping center, retail. We, our book ends in 1977, so <laughs> we'll deal with that in the next book. <laughs> in the far back, please. Hi, uh, I'm a first year master's of planning student here at Irvine. Uh, it seems like the, the planning community is very much uh, um, indicative of the time in terms of like uh, being auto oriented or having some more separated uses and just the sheer size. It's hard to plan so far in the future, but if you could look back, what would you do differently to, I guess, anticipate, uh, I guess, the, the sustainable, more uh, smart growth era we're in now? I, I know Irvine's adapting a lot with things like bike lanes and public transportation, but you know, the bones of the, the city are what it is. So what would you have done? Well, I'll, I'll feel that. We actually incorporated a corridor for a light rail transit down the, well, we don't have, I got to, you couldn't even see those targets. Down the middle of, of the, uh, between Alton and Barranca, it would come out of the industrial area by the airport, go down the corridor and link up and end up at the Irvine Transportation Center. That was only one link, that was part of the countywide system that went on through Santa Ana, Orange, Anaheim, ended up, started up at the Fullerton Transportation Center. It was on the ballot, I think it was early 2000s. They voted it. Citizens voted it down. And even commentary from people living in Woodbridge, I remember, <laughs> they considered it would be a blight. And it was in the middle of, the, of all, between Alton and Branca, which is a quarter to half a mile itself, it would be right along the flood control channel. You wouldn't even see it. It was gonna be elevated lines so you wouldn't be crossing all the, all the streets. Anyway, so we did incorporate that in the central villages of Irvine. William Pereira's original plan talked about how there'd be so little need for the car. My analysis as a non-planner is the car won. 
<laughs> well, there's just no other way around. Yeah, you know, this is even though the bus system isn't that attractive. I mean, this is suburbia. The densities are suburban densities. We're not. It's not a dense, you know, urban place. Thank you. Right here. Uh, yeah, uh, Randy Lewis, um, Sam McCullough, in his book uh, about the history of the university. Sam was a historian here at UCI. Um, <clears throat> gives great credit to Dan Aldrich on the issue of covenants. Mm -hmm. uh, and would someone care to speak to that? Uh, the story that I've heard over the years is that Dan was quite firm with regards to the Irvine Company that either those covenants are eliminated or there'll be no University of California campus at this location. The history that, that I read um, gives Clark Kerr the credit for raising the issue. Um, Ray Watson um, believed so strongly that the Irvine Company did not uh, put covenants on the land that when Clark Kerr's book came out, he called the author and tried to get him to change the information because Ray said, I was at the Irvine Company, I know this never happened. What I think happened, and I'll preface it by saying this, at the county archives I found a deed signed by James Irvine. And it was a deed for a sale of land. I read it carefully. There were no covenants on the land. I don't think James Irvine put covenants on his property for a lot of reasons. I think what happened was, as land got transferred in the 20s, 30s, 40s, the standard language at First American was no blacks, no Jews, et cetera. Um, but to your point, Aldrich, everything that I read from Aldrich's oral history, I didn't see him as the advocate. It was Clark Kerr who felt strongly about it, as interestingly did Roger Revell in San Diego. So that was what we found. We have time for just one or two more questions. Yes. Um, Bill Broder, uh, I have two questions. You can answer one of them, and then someone else can have a chance. The deep history question, the, uh, the uh, Mexican land grants were notoriously rough and on top and conflict with the Spanish land grants. And then the California Land Commission kind of wiped them all out in the 1850s and early 60s. Did Irvine have to buy up a whole lot of claims, or did he only buy the uh, winning claim, if you know the answer? Second question, development question, you can answer this one instead. I gathered, I think, from your book that somehow the university regents extended a broad hand on the development of the rest of Irvine because they were unhappy with how Westwood had been developed by the chances in the 20s. <clears throat> answer one or the other, please. Second answer is that um, the regents saw what happened at UCLA and wanted to prevent um, a rich community being built around it where students and professors could not um, live. That's why Irvine was so um, attractive because it was owned by a single land source. Your first question, there were three ranchos. Yeah, and further on the, the UCLA the question the, the, with size, UCLA campus is about 425 acres. As Mike highlighted, Irvine with the original land and then the inclusion areas that were added is 1,500 acres. And that was a big concern was to have, have enough land to not get cramped in uh, as UCLA has uh, over the decades. We'll stay as long as anybody wants to answer questions. Oh, they only told me 10 minutes over. Okay. <laughs> so we have four minutes left. <laughs> All right. Um, yes, additional questions here in the room? Yes. Um, do you think that they, when they built this you know, university, they did to keep in mind of, like, you know, the student professor movements going on in, like, other universities, like, like UC Berkeley, UCLA. And so they designed the whole university to encourage students from uh, I don't think there was any decision from a, either an architectural or an academic standpoint uh, where that issue came up. In fact, um, McCullough in his book and in other sources gives um, real credit to Dan Aldrich for managing the student protests that did happen here for not becoming violent. And I believe that was yeah. the case. Right. I almost want to repeat that question because we get that in special collections a lot, actually, mm -hmm. that there is a, a, 
a line of thinking that the design of the campus <clears throat> was influenced by um, the desire to deter camp uh, student organization and protests. But it sounds like you didn't find. I don't think so. I think um, you know Pereira mm -hmm. was a guy who dreamed big, and the other part of our book talks about the Transamerica Tower. You want to see a story about controversy? Read about the Transamerica Tower. Uh, they hated it in San Francisco. So Pereira, who's a, a big picture guy, is now given um, a thousand acres to work with. So he's not going to think small. He thinks big. Remember, this is 1960. Uh, Berkeley really erupted 64, 65. So this kind of predated any of that. I, I, I found no evidence whatsoever that architectural or, yeah. or academic planning had anything to do with curbing student unrest. One more question, anyone? Yes. Did your book go into a little bit more detail about that, lock, that early auction? No, no. Actually, we, we really start 1947 uh, with the death of James Irvine and go to 1977. Uh, the best, uh, Eric has got the best source. It's the Robert Clellan book. It's called The Irvine Ranch, written uh, and um, uh, published by the Huntington Library. It's hard to find these days, but that really, that's kind of the touchstone. And we used, we used that, we used Ray Watson's writings, we used the other research that we did, a lot of in-person. Recognized Bill Watt, who was a, a VP at the Irvine Company, built a lot of beautiful apartments. Bill talked to us at length, he lived a lot of this, so if you'd like to hear how it really happened. He's he's right here too. Well, I want to yeah, I would add we we it was sort of a just in time effort. Um, Mike has talked about doing a book like this for decades, and I always offered to help. And then he invited to elevate me to being a co-author, and I was quite honored. But during the course of our research, we interviewed forty-one people who had worked on. Uh, the planning uh, for the ranch in the 1960s uh, up until 1977, Bill Watt being one of them. And um, it was a just-in-time effort. Uh, I think uh, at last count, five of the folks that we have interviewed have since passed on. So we felt it was a great opportunity to get history before it escaped us. And um, we were grateful for all the people who offered their experience and insights. Well, great. I want to thank Mike Pike and Robert for their amazing presentations that have enriched our knowledge of the development of the region and the campus. And thank you, Crystal, also for your moderating. Please join me in giving them a big round of applause. Before we break, I also want to thank the library staff and students who made this today's event possible. And I also want to um, additionally add that this event would not have been possible without the Gateway Society. The library's Gateway Society um, is a very important group. I'd like to invite you all to become a member of the library's Gateway Society, which really helps to support UC's, UCI's research teaching and patient care. It supports the library's role as a major information resource for the community, and it also helps us to present public programs like today's event. Uh, there's a brochure at our registration table, or you can touch base with Angelica Vogel, who's in the room right over here. Um, so to wrap up, to help us improve our programs, we have a, a brief survey on the seats of your chairs or if you're a remote attendee there's a link in the chat uh, we invite you to fill that out before you leave and we wanted to let you know that we have recorded this event and so all of the attendees both in person and remote will receive an email from us with a link to that recording which will also be on our YouTube channel so thank you again thank you to our speakers one last time